Okay. Um, unmute, please. Okay. I'm unmuted now. Can everyone see me? Okay. And yeah, just to test, can everyone hear me? Am I yes, audible? Yes, we can. All right. Yeah, Bo. Yeah, go. We can hear you. All right. All right, happy Sabbath, Saints. Happy Sabbath. And daughters of the Most High God, how are you doing? We are fine. Thank Bless. you. We're fine. Your and great to hear your voices. I greet you all once again in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My role is um, an important but minor one this morning. I'm actually here to be blessed like all of you, but also to welcome you all uh, and also to introduce our speaker before we start. Okay. I do want to take a moment to welcome everyone because I know there are various uh, live streams going on, but we still woke up and you still chose to, to, to join this particular one. For that we thank you and ask that the Lord may bless you. I also want to introduce our speaker as I had indicated earlier. Our speaker uh, by the name, she is actually Pastor Candy Swartz from the Cape Conference. I hear and know that she's passionate about women's uh, ministries and uh, for today, she's going to be talking to us, uh, addressing us uh, and the topic she chose or that was chosen is the greatest love of God. What a topic, I'm so looking forward to it. Um, however, before handing over to her, I am going to ask the Kulati family to render us an item after which I will pray and then let our speaker take the platform. Lord, that the curtains of 
Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you. Thank you again to the Kulati girls and mommy. What does the church say to the Kulati family from the comfort of our homes? Can I hear a resounding amen? You may even Amen. 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 For the sake of those that just joined us a little bit late, I'm about hey. to hand over to the speaker for the day. I'm going to introduce her again for the sake of those oh, that were not there when I did. Uh, her name is Pastor Candy Swartz. She is from the Cape Conference, and she's going to be addressing us on the topic of the greatest love of God. What does the church say? From the comfort of our homes, I hope Amen. you are Amen. 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 Thank you. I'm for this one. Before I hand over to Pastor Candy Swartz, I am going to ask us to bow our heads and close our eyes for a word of prayer. We are now praying. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you, Lord Jehovah, God Almighty, for your merciful um, and, and, and love, O oh God, and for being a redeemer, O oh Father, and for at all times, O oh Lord Jehovah, taking us, Lord Jehovah, with your hand, O oh Father. O oh Lord, we also want to thank you for being a loving God, O oh Father. We also want to thank you, Father, for the Sabbath, O oh Lord, which is a blessing to us, O oh God, which makes us remember, Father God, that you are forever with us and that you are loving, O oh Lord. Father, as we are about to hear, Lord, your word uh, through your main servant, O oh God, Jehovah, we ask you, O oh Lord, that you may touch our hearts. We ask you, O oh Lord, that it may land, O oh God, on fertile soil, O oh Father, which is our hearts, O oh God. We ask, O oh Lord, that it may bring us closer, Father, to the cross, O oh Lord, where we will find and see your love in action, O oh God, Jehovah. O oh Father, we ask you all this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, knowing, O oh Father, that everything that we ask for, believing from the bottom of our hearts, you deliver, O oh God. All this, O oh Father, we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Um, Amen. Amen. I would like to give over Amen. to Pastor Candy Swartz to bless us. What is Let me take this moment and greet Peniel Church and uh, immediately uh, say my appreciation for choosing me for a work like this. And uh, as you have already aptly uh, shared, I am very passionate about women's ministries. But more than that, I am humbled that God has uh, actually favored me like this. Today, as I celebrate my 61st, he has chosen me to stand before his children that he may bless us and open himself through his word using a vessel like me, a humble vessel like me. And so indeed, I am humbled and grateful to God that I know I will forever praise for loving me like this. Um, we have come to very strange times in our lives. As I've also just said, I'm celebrating my birthday today, but when one ponders what is going around us, all of us, we're supposed to be all closed, mm -hmm. not just in doors, but in fear. But due God's greatest love, we are still standing like the lamb standing uh, by the throne of God. Allow me to invite the church of God to turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter five. We are going through a short passage there, verses one to seven, and I'm reading in your hearing. And I saw in the right hand of him 
who sat on the throne, a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. May the Lord bless the reading of his word now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Shall we bow our Amen. heads for a short word of prayer? Heavenly Father, dearest Lord Jesus, we are bowing low before you to humble ourselves and recognize ourselves as creatures created by your hand, but much loved in that you, as God, decided to come down and take the flesh of lowly humanity. And not only so, but die and be buried, and then you rose again. Father, bless us today with your word. All in Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. Allow me to say God's love cannot be compared to anyone or to anything but to himself, who is both its embodiment and revealer in Christ. And uh, Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, in fact, are one vision. They are one message. Revelation 4 being a mere introduction to the greater act that unfolds in Revelation 5. A, a vision, in fact, that reveals God's love in a superlative manner. Well, we have known God to love us from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when he gave the promise of the, of the seed of a woman. And uh, we have known God to love us uh, through all the acts that he has uh, uh, done to his children that he favored. How he calls Abraham and ultimately uses his posterity, Moses, to set his children free from bondage in Egypt. We have known the, the love of God in many respects in how when Israel had been taken to exile in Babylon, God, after 70 years, visited his favored uh, family, his favored nation, his favored children, and brought them back to their dignity. And we have known God to love us by sending all the, the prophets with a special word and special message for us. But we have also known God for loving us so much by, you know, allowing himself to be humble, to descend in humility to the standard of humanity. There he served. That is, he came not to be served, but he came to serve us serve us in that he came to reveal this love of God. 
you know, today we are grappling uh, with everything around us, trying to find love, lasting love, holding love. And instead of that, uh, women get killed, men get killed, children get murdered, and a lot that is not good is happening around us. Nothing is speaking to love. And now we, we have come today to get to understand this greatest love that God is declaring for us. And in these few verses, we are going to try and root the word of God and ultimately realize this love that we've been seeking, this love that apparently has been uh, present around us, in us, but we have never recognized it. As I've said, chapter five unfolds the events in God's throne room now. There are two marvelous and quite important for us to capture. You see, in this vision, we first see God seated on his throne as the one with the right to rule. You know, no one, nobody sits on a throne and they do not have that right. Um, this is actually the first thing John sees, actually. God on the throne. God seated on his high throne. And not just anywhere, but in heaven. This we get to hear on in chapter 4, verse 2, in fact. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one set on the throne. And again, as we have read in chapter 5, verse 1, and in the right hand of the one seated on the throne uh, was a scroll written on the back and inside, everywhere. God is thus highlighting by sitting in or taking that position who he is to us. He is the one that rules. He rules not as kings on earth, but he rules over all the universe. He rules the heaven. He rules the earth. He rules the seas. He rules the everywhere and rules over everyone. You know, he rules despite the great controversy that we find ourselves in. You know, he rules over the dominion of the universe and added to his right to rule, we are shown that he is holding something in his right hand in particular. It is a scroll written on the back and on the inside, which signify that God is the author and the owner of the scroll. A scroll, you know, that embodies such importance that no one who does not have the mind of God can understand. And realize also that this scroll is written everywhere. So there is no space left that is not written on the scroll so that no one can add anything on there. God alone is the author of this scroll. And the scroll is sealed with seven seals. With seven seals, what is contained in the scroll? As I was uh, going around and about preparing, I got to understand, I needed to understand what is contained, what is in the scroll. The scroll contains the mystery of salvation that God plans to reveal. It contains the secret purpose of establishing his kingdom on earth until the fullness of his glory is revealed. 
but it cannot be read until all the seven seals are broken. This he has uh, 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 given to Isaac, Isaiah, uh, rather, in chapter 9, and also to Jeremiah to note that only him has a right to this scroll, to the scroll because its revelations are marvelous. It is sealed with seven seals, meaning that it is complete. It is permanent. No one can take it away from him. And it holds, as I've just shared with you, it, it holds important contents, important information, not just for God, but for the benefit of us, well beings, for the benefit of us, human, about a crisis that happens in heaven. For as we note, God seated on his throne, holding a scroll that is completely sealed, we get to understand from the angel, the mighty angel that makes a proclamation who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals. I want to imagine everyone looked to their neighbor in heaven and when they realized none among them could be found who is worthy to open, to open the scroll and they now decided to look beyond and in the other planets, unfallen worlds. And even there, no one could be found that was worthy to open the scroll. They came down to earth and the, man, the matter was even worse when it came down here to us. No one, I mean, no one was worthy to open the scroll. The seal and its contents are controlled by the sovereign purpose and the power of God. Therefore, no one had the audacity, no one could dare come close to God to open the scroll. You know, what is in there is so important to him, God, and he values that content. He values that content due to such high control and deep significance of the scroll no one anywhere in the universe is found worthy to crouch close even worse stand at the right side of god the side of his government you see when you come to the right side of god you are approaching you know the rule of his government the power of his government, his right to rule lies on his right side. You see, therein uh, lies the secrets of his judgment and salvation of everything in the universe. Beloved friends, no one, no one could be found that could open the scroll and break the seals. No one. It was a crisis. I we are hearing a bit of a quiet from the heavenlies. Maybe they were confused, wondering what kind of question is this? And then John the Revelator, having been afforded a chance of a lifetime to rise above and be part of uh, worship in the throne room, cries, he weeps, he laments, we hear that he cried loudly. He beat his chest, he was beside himself for he was thinking about the hope that he kept preaching back on earth. He thought about the martyrs, the people that died, you know, proclaiming the love of God. A love of God that seemed to be thwarted right now. Beloved and friends, when you look into what is contained 
in there, in that scroll. The secrets of the Godhead, the secrets of the rule of his government, the secrets of how he created humanity, the secrets of uh, what he implanted in humanity so that even if humanity falls, he would be able again to redeem them and bring us back to him. Oh, what great love God has for us. What great love he has extended to us, even though we decided to give our back to him. What is contained therein? What is contained in the scroll? You see, what is contained in there follows the Old Testament law of the Jubilee. The law of the Jubilee that spells lost property by whatever means cannot be permanently taken from its original owner. You see, I'm thinking of South Africa right now. We keep saying we have land. But when we check closely, we come to realize that it's only about 30% of this land that we can still hold a claim onto. More than 70% of it has been taken already. It is out of our hands. But according to the law of the Jubilee, it was supposed to have been given back to us after 50 years. It's been more than 400 years now it's been taken and no one seems prepared to bring it back to us. What's contained in the scroll is the law of the Jubilee. It speaks to freedom. It speaks to freeing those that are in bondage. It speaks to our ultimate, ultimate freedom. No, no one can take anyone's land permanently. Even if I have given my land freely because of the lack and want that I've experienced after 50 years, the land is supposed to be returned back to me. And so in the scroll, uh, is included this law of the jubilee god is claiming as himself as the one that created us and upon whom we have and hold his image and therefore him being our owner no one has a right to take us away from his hand even if we had offered ourselves to that other without returning God's uh, property back to him. We are his property. We are God's property. And he is ready and prepared to come take it, whatever it takes. And indeed, it took all from him. It took everything for him to bring his property back to himself. Oh, what great love God has for us. What great love. You see, it needed one who knew well the inner secrets for a redeemer to come and reclaim a property. As we read, beloved, uh, in the book of um, Ruth, chapter 3, that um, Boaz had to belong in the inner circle. Boaz had to know deeper secrets of this family. Boaz needed to, to hold the keys to the rights of this family for him to be able to redeem Naomi and Ruth. And indeed, Boaz did it. And he was the type of Christ. He was the type of Christ in that Christ also came. He did not wait for us to go to him. 
as I read and dramatize John chapter 3, verse 6, that God had the world, that he opened wide his arms, ready for us to jump and reach onto his bosom. But we couldn't. For when we tried to spring up, you see, the mud that we had brought ourselves into started to drag us back in. And the Father, God, the one who is love, saw what was happening, realized the demise we were in, and he threw down a lifeline. He gave his only son. He threw down a lifeline that was so long that it could reach to us. He threw his only begotten son so that whoever chooses can reach up and hold on to the lifeline. The lifeline had such power that it could hoist us from this muddy clay and put us on a pedestal, wash us with his blood. Beloved, we've been washed. We've been washed under a shower of the blood of God, under the shower of the blood of the Son of God, the beloved Son of God. And so that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, God loves us. Loves us with a love so great we cannot even begin to explain it, let alone understand it. Oh, beloved, we are hearing that as John was wailing and uh, having lost all hope for humanity to be dragged out, even though he had repeatedly told them about a redeemer that is coming. I'm remembering Isaiah, you know, proclaiming to his people that a son has been born, a son is given, his name is wonderful. Oh, beloved, oh, beloved, that was only a promise then, a promise then. John had gone past that. He is one of those, as he declares himself in First John chapter 1, verse 1, that we are not telling you about someone we do not know, but we are. Te- I am telling you, I am sharing with you about someone I've rubbed shoulders with, someone I've laid on his side, someone I ate with from the same dish, and all this time I did not recognize it was God I was sharing. It was God I was rubbing shoulders with. It was God I lay beside. Remember, John is the one disciple we are told was the most loved. The reason being, he was the youngest among the disciples. He was the youngest. Oh, beloved, look at how great the love of God is for us, for the, the angel, the mighty angel passes. And I think, and I wonder, the elders, the 24 elders looked up at John and were mesmerized at this weeping, this hopelessness, for they realized they were part of the train that, you know, uh, accompanied Christ as he was being taken up to heaven. Uh, remember, when Christ died, as he declared, it is finished. Some graves opened and people came out, issued out. People resurrected as first fruits of the resurrection. And when Christ went back to heaven, he took them with. This is why we are hearing in, 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 in Psalms 24, uh, angels playfully you know leading christ back to heaven saying open ye all ye gates ancient gates open wide your gates so that the king of glory may come in 
and the others ask, who is that king of glory? He is the one. Oh, my beloved, before I get to there, let us hear what the elders do. They send one of, their, of theirs to John to tell him, weep not. Do not weep. This is verse 5 and 6. Do not weep. For there is a lion of the tribe of Judah that has conquered. The lion of the tribe of Judah that has triumphed. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Oh, my beloved, John is stopped from wailing and lamenting. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. He is able not only to open the scroll, but to also break free the seven seals, the complete seals by which the scroll is closed in. But how is he worthy? How is he worthy? How is he worthy? And this takes me immediately to the book of Genesis again, chapter one, Verse 27, when God, after creating uh, by declaring uh, his word that everything must be and it becomes, he now sits in a meeting. You know, he sits in a strategic meeting with himself and they, and they put up a plan to, to, to create his prized creation. So God created, this is Genesis 1 verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Hence, we can safely say Christ is our kinsman's redeemer. Like Boaz, he is our kinsman redeemer. This was fulfilled in Christ to be our redeemer. You can go and read for yourself in Luke chapter one, verses 50, 58, 68, 72, and 78. You can also read from John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, Romans chapter five, verses seven and eight, as well as Ephesians chapter one, verse uh, seven. Beloved, embedded in Jesus' redemptive name is the theme of the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And this comes up already way back in the beginnings. In the book of Genesis, chapter 49, you know, um, Jacob you know, full, overflowing with the spirit, declares uh, to his sons, and in particular to Judah, that he is like a lion, a lion that will rule over nations, a lion that will be mighty to save, a lion that will stand and no one would be able to sit him. This raises the image of strength and majesty and majesty. Christ is that lion. Christ is that lion, a king which Christ has become. And all nations will bow before him in obedience. All knees shall bow down below him. All knees, even those that pierced him. There is going to come a time, however much others hated him and opposed him, there is going to come a time when everyone, literally everyone, from Adam to the very last man that will be on earth, when Christ will be standing in the sky, will all fall down, prostrate before him and declare him king of kings and lord of lords. No, not even the devil will be spared. 
not even he. But as beautiful as this motif of a lion is, that is majestic, you know, that is strong. Uh, John is commanded to not only listen, but to look. And so John lifts his eyes. I want to imagine if it was me, I would be so curious to see how this imagery of the lion is embodied in Christ. Lo and behold, what does he see? What does he behold? What he sees is amazing compared to the lion that has conquered. Conquered, yes, conquered. Because it is strong and mighty in war. Conquered is quite an important verb. If I may just take a turn there, that gets used 23 book of Revelation, which is uh, about half as or twice as much as it appears in the entire New Testament writings. But then back to what John sees. What does he see? John sees a lamb. Like, can we imagine a lamb? A lamb is not strong. A lamb is shaking so much that its mother needs to be close by to prop it along, encourage it to move along, for it is in its movement that it gains strength. So John, instead of seeing a lion, sees a lamb. What a mix-up. What a mix-up. But then isn't it usual in apocalyptic uh, writings, that is the writings of prophecies uh, concerning the end of times? For instance, if we can look uh, in the book of Daniel chapter 2, we read about a lion in chapter seven, rather than chapter two. We read about a lion that has four wings of an eagle. Where have you ever seen a lion with, with wings, a mix up as equally as we are finding here? And it is not just this uh, weak, shaky lamb as he sees it, but it is a lamb that looks as if it had been slain. Blood is issuing out of it. It has been slain, beloved. It has been slain. Remember that sword that pierced the Son of Man on the cross and water oozed out of him as well as blood. Beloved, this lamb looked as if it had been slain. Wow. It's not a warrior as, as, as Joshua saw in chapter 5, verses 13 and uh, to 15, he sees a man holding high his sword and he asks him, are you with us or against us? Ah, my beloved, we learn that this, in fact, as he declares himself, is the commander of the army of God himself like the lion of the tribe of Judah. But now what John, the problem is, what John sees is a lamb looking as though it has been slain. But here is present the king, personified by the lion, who is equally the suffering servant, the one that came to serve us, to serve us by loving us, by healing us, by revealing himself uh, and God to us, by helping us, you know, prop us up and uh, encourage us to move along, to move on, so we can gain more strength and more and momentum towards our future. Oh, beloved. Beloved, this king is also a suffering servant. And as I conclude, allow me to say, as much as the lamb seems weak, like it has been slain, 
but it is also standing. It is standing as the king ready to rule. I'm not sure if you are hearing me. This lamb is standing. It is not ready to sit, not to fall down. It is standing. Where is it standing? Right at the center of the throne. Beloved, you see, around God is glory. No one would be able to approach. And after that, is the, he is settled by a rainbow. Which, is, which carries the promises that God will fulfill his promises to us. And after that, there are the four living creatures, fearsome, powerful, with strength, strength that no one can stand against. Beloved, there is not only the four living creatures, there is also the 24 elders seated on their own 24 thrones. And there is the multitudes of angels. And beyond the angels are uh, humanity. In, and uh, we, we cannot count them. We cannot count them. How did the lamb break through all that security? How did he break through there? For we are hearing he is right at the center, standing next to God. And Christ does not only stand, but comes to the right side of God, his hand of his rulership, his hand of his strength and power. He stands there to receive his seat in rulership. He stands, but he also moves. For we are told he comes, he comes, to the right side of the one seated on the throne and takes the scroll from him. And amazingly, the one seated on the throne does not fight against him. He easily opens his hand and gives it over to him. Oh, my beloved, the greatest love of God he has bestowed upon us was embodied in Christ. And all we can do now is to start a song. All we can do now is to break in worship. Start worshiping. Lie prostrate before God like all the living creatures and the 24 elders and the multitude of angels and the multitudes of humanity. They all bowed low before God and the Lamb, praising them, worshiping them. Beloved, that is what's left for us to do. It is certain, it is certain God loves us so much that he has locked, already locked our redemption. He has it in his hand. And in fact, Christ now holds it and is busy unraveling it before us. We will go through tribulations, trials. Remember, seals are being broken. Seals are being opened. Let's not give in and give up. Let's not allow anyone to whisper anything otherwise other than this love that has been revealed to us. God loves us. God loves us. God loves us. Amen. 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 Amen, Fundisi. Amen uh, and amen again. Thank you so much, Pastor. We are indeed blessed. And indeed, a whole nation will bow before his him rather in obedience. Um, I am going to ask Umam Tzidi to pray for us in closing, but before I do that, I want to mention three bullet points that I learned or took 
as um, you know, from, from this message, my, my take home points, and they are as follows. The Lord was here to save us. The Lord was here to strengthen us. The Lord is still here to give us courage. The Lord, the Lord, and indeed all nation will bow before him in obedience. What does the church say to that? Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Pastor. May the good Lord richly bless you. And I trust everyone was blessed. And I trust that out of this message, we, may, we will blossom from it and go share it with the others. Thank you. And thank you again. Indeed, we serve a faithful God. And his love for us was demonstrated this morning. Amen. Uh, Mamsi, right. can I ask you to close for us in prayer? Shall we bow our heads as we pray? Our kind and heavenly Father, we just want to take this moment to thank you in a very special way. You are a God that is able, dear Lord, to prepare a table before our enemies. The evil one had intended of us that at this moment we should be worrying and also looking down on ourselves, not knowing what to do or what to say to, to the things that he has done to us. But you are the one that always has the last word. You are able, dear Lord, to prepare the sermon through your daughter, Candy. And he, she has just unraveled things that we never knew of before. We have read the Bible in so many times, but the wisdom that you have bestowed upon her has blown me. And I want to believe that I'm not the only one, but all of us have been blown. Oh, Lord and Father of mankind, I pray in a very special way for Pastor Swartz that you increase her territory, dear Lord, and be able to grant her the desires of her heart. We want to thank you that you were able, dear Lord, to whisper into the ears of the, of the WM in our church that they should also prepare for us a speaker such as this. Oh, Lord and Father of mankind, where would we be without you? Where would we be without the, the lamb that was able, dear Lord, to die in our place, giving us his position and taking our position. Lord, we want to thank you. We honor you. We give glory to you for the things that you've done for us. Help us to know you better in our lives and keep us in good faith. For this is my humble prayer in the mighty name of our Lord and Christ. Amen. 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 Uh, at this point in time, I would like to hand over to leadership. I thank, thank you, you all for the wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen, Mama. Amen, Mama. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank you all for tuning in with us and the support that you have given us as the AWM when we were um, revealing the program that we have for this week. Uh, it, the Lord indeed was truly with us. We have prayed for this program and the Lord has showed up in big and big time. And I just want to thank you for your support. And most importantly, I just want to thank you, Uma Muswats, Mfunsuswats, for allowing the Lord to use her in a such special way. Um, we thank you for the message. We thank you for, for the Lord that um, he has shown you this message so that you can give it to us uh, this afternoon. Um, I just want to take this opportunity and thank you all and to remind you that um, the program is not over. Uh, we are coming back again for the afternoon program. We will be sitting with this Nini uh, Mulifi.